Maya is the president and CEO of her own firm, Global Policy Solutions, which is a social change strategy firm based here in Washington, D.C. Um, she has a um, tremendous resume that, that's in your, uh, in your packet. Um, she has um, previously served as vice president of research and programs at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, um, uh, as a senior resident scholar for the health and income security uh, uh, area at the National Urban League, and Chief of Staff to Congressman Charles Rangel. Uh, she served on the uh, professional staff of the House Ways and Means Committee uh, and as a CPCF uh, Legislative Fellow in, in the Office of Congressman Melvin Watt, uh, among other positions. Uh, she has written widely. She has several, several books. Uh, she is a frequent speaker on um, uh, radio and television shows, uh, on NPR, on CNN, Black Entertainment Television, and many others. Um, I think that um, um, we around town uh, see Maya as, uh, if not the busiest uh, woman uh, in this area, certainly one of the busiest, and we're very grateful that she could find the time to be with us today. So we welcome Maya Rackham. Thank you, Charles. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, be introduced by a colleague and friend, and I thank you for the invitation today. I'm sure you heard from Jim Carr earlier, so I'm sure he explained that we are at a, we are at a crisis point in our country right now. Uh, that, you know, in terms of the indicators, if you're looking at unemployment, if you're looking at rising poverty levels, if you're looking at mortgage foreclosures, uh, we have a situation where racial and ethnic population, low-income populations, of course, as you all know, this is a confounding variable, uh, are in desperate straits. Uh, they, prior to the crisis, they were the recipients of predatory lending. Uh, they were already uh, experiencing a racial wealth gap uh, in this country. Uh, as you all know, the statistics show that, um, uh, Federal Reserve Board statistics show, uh, that for every one dollar in wealth owned by the typical white family, uh, African Americans have 10 cents uh, and Latinos have 12 cents. Uh, and so, as you all know, this is a result of historical uh, disparities uh, in terms of how policies have been enacted in our country. Everything from slavery, which didn't allow you to earn uh, uh, any kind of wealth for your work, uh, to, you know, um, housing policies, which were often, you know, redlining communities and you name it. Uh, people of color have been disadvantaged historically in this country and we see it reflected in the wealth disparities. And now we see a movement. And this movement is building and it is growing and it is trying to address those historical disparities. And the movement is focused on looking at how you actually leverage public policy to advance closing the racial wealth gap. And so with that, uh, today's conversation, and I do want to stress this, this conversation, and I'd love for you to, as at any point during uh, the slide presentation, to interrupt me, let's have a dialogue about the issues, and, and let this be a, a, a bi-directional uh, conversation. Uh, so with that, asset building policies, not, not paternalistic, poverty-focused, traditional, you know, let's give you aid, how about building wealth over a lifetime? This is the new proposition. And the other proposition is, at a time when many in the media want to say that we are post-racial, <laughs> that, that absolutely we cannot be focused on this asset building agenda without focusing on race. Okay, so those are my fundamental propositions to you for today, and let's get started. The country is actually facing an economic storm, another storm that's actually even greater, I would argue, than the current economic crisis. And that storm is the demographic storm that's on the horizon. The very populations who have traditionally been excluded from the mainstream of America's economic life, social life, political life, are now at the precipice of becoming the nation's majority population. Now let's sit back and think about what that means. When you have a population that's been traditionally excluded, and you know that they're at the bottom of the tier, primarily when you're talking about you know, economic indicators, uh, educational indicators, and yet this is the, the population that will become the nation's majority in the future. What does that mean for the economic productivity of this, the, this country uh, in the future? What does that actually mean? And so I talked about the racial wealth gap, uh, that we know that children of, the, of color in the United States 
disproportionately receive that lower quality of education, that it results in lower college attendance, poor workforce uh, development, poverty, uh, lower rates of savings and wealth accumulation, and yet these folks are becoming the majority of the U.S. population by the year 2042, okay? It means one of two things. It means we can, our leaders can continue to bury their heads in the sand and act like this is not a demographic shift that's about to occur and that nothing needs to change on the policy horizon in order to address it. And I guarantee you, if our leaders actually take that position, America's quality of life, the kind of life that we have become accustomed to, will be irrevocably reversed backwards back to the pre-industrialized era, era of this country, certainly uh, in terms of our status uh, as a, a world global power, uh, but also in terms of our standard of living. And then there's another factor, uh, and that is the issue of globalization. U.S. jobs are absolutely uh, not stable. Uh, there's no longer an era where we're working, graduating from college or graduating from high school and working for the company in the local town for 40 years. That's not the case anymore. Uh, globalization has created a destabilization in international markets. Capital flows are going back and forth. Multinational corporations are locating pieces and components of their companies uh, anywhere where it's cheaper, the productivity, the labor is cheaper. Uh, and it's created significant, uh, uh, certainly dead zones in the economy here in the United States. Uh, we see Detroit underwater. We see other uh, areas that have traditionally relied on the industrialized economy uh, underwater. And this is significant uh, for uh, this perfect storm. So we've got an anatomy of a tipping point. A poorly educated majority minority population with low skills, low income, and poor health equals an economic disaster for the United States. Economic disaster for the United States. And so we've got to convince policymakers that they need to do something about it. If you care about this nation, if you care about our standard of living, if you care about advancing this country and making sure that it remains a global power and certainly an economic powerhouse capable of caring for its citizens in the 21st century economy, you have got to address closing the racial wealth gap. And so with that, we've got challenges to actually doing this, right? Uh, we've got challenges that include fact, the fact, A, that you know, many of our nation's leaders do Either, either think that we're in a post-racial society or they're scared to talk about the issue of race. Even our president is scared to talk about the issue of race. Sorry to say it, uh, but we have been working diligently over the past two years trying to um, get them to address this issue uh, substantively. Uh, they didn't have to do it rhetorically. They didn't have to be out front waving the flag saying so we're doing something on race. But they've been even scared to address it privately. Uh, and so we're still putting pressure on them, but this is an issue that absolutely has to be addressed. And it would have been nice, uh, theoretically, for the first African-American president uh, to be at the forefront of, of trying to get at this, uh, but we haven't gotten them there yet. But it's also an issue of silos. Uh, public policies that are important for this challenge are splintered into multiple and competing areas of interest. So, you know, right now we're considering on Capitol Hill, they're considering on Capitol Hill, the Education and sec sec Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, you know, that education policy is seen as completely separate from health policy. As you all know, the patient, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act passed last year, uh, which is seen as completely separate from workforce development policies, which is seen as completely separate from income security policies, which is seen as completely separate from housing policies. But when we're talking about asset building and closing the racial wealth gap, we can't be looking at these issues in silos. It's not sufficient uh, because all of these policy streams are important for building the economic and wealth security of families. And so with that, the issue of silos is a barrier. Uh, certainly the issue of pol policymakers not wanting to address race is a, a, a barrier. Uh, but also the issue of policy versus politics and that disconnect uh, when policy is treated as if it's disconnected from the political uh, realm. Uh, so, you know, for example, um, you know, and, and actually, you know, certain ways uh, we perpetuate that when we actually don't ask politicians or don't hold politicians accountable for the policies that they pursue once they're in office. Uh, so with that, 
This is, these are barriers to solving the problem. But policy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's powered by and contextualized within a political system. Uh, pol political power is actually a prerequisite for securing desired public policy. And the political power also has been concentrated, as we know in the past, in the hands of the majority population. Uh, and then we've seen the benefits of that power actually reflected in, in the policy outcomes and certainly in the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, socio-political outcomes that we've seen in this nation. Uh, and I argue that democracy is actually undermined in the absence of countervailing forces, and certainly democracy is undermined when all communities are not empowered to fully participate. So, my solution. We must develop a comprehensive, holistic approach to closing the racial wealth gap. That means bridging silos, connecting smart politics to policy. And that's why I'm here today, to talk about how we actually connect these things and to talk about how we can become empowered advocates. Now, I have a concept that I have kind of um, shopped around. Uh, in 2006, I first presented it to our um, our uh, Experts of Color Network, uh, I think it was out in California when we were in Santa Barbara. And this was the concept of actually a uh, uh, an asset house. Uh, that we, because we can't think of these policies in the silo, uh, why don't we think about them in the context of, 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 certainly people talk about it, about asset building over a lifetime, but I also argue we can think about it as building an asset house. Uh, and with this, you see that social insurance policies and communal assets are on the bottom, Policies promoting individual group asset accumulation uh, are actually the structure of the house. And let me back up to the foundation. The absolutely, if you want to get to the top, which is individual asset building, we actually have to understand that that cannot occur in an absence, in a, in a vacuum. It has to take place in collaboration in conjunction with other kinds of asset building policies. And this is what I mean. So at the social insurance, at the foundational level, the communal assets include your social insurance programs like Social Security, Medicare, Universal Healthcare, which we don't have yet, uh, certainly UI, uh, wage protection insurance, quality public education, and many of us don't see citizenship as an asset, but it actually is. Because we know that those without it certainly do not have uh, the benefits of certain things. Uh, and then on top of that, you have to have policies promoting individual group asset accumulation. And this includes everything from progressive tax structures uh, to pro progressive education policies to progressive so savings policies, health policies, housing policies, business development policies, safety net, certainly development programs and incentives, and certainly compensatory measures uh, that ensure that are uh, reinforced by uh, a fair and just legal justice system. So with that, these are the, you know, the structure of the house that helps to support. If you have these things in place, and there's certainly a support uh, uh, for building the house. And then you go to your attic. Uh, and in certainly, uh, the, actually, before you get to the attic, you get to your insulation for the attic, which is your communi community assets. And we tend to overlook things like kinship networks or culture or community nonprofits, faith-based organizations financial and educational institutions that are endemic, uh, certainly, to your community. Um, I, I know that Native American communities traditionally look at community assets as being one of their most valuable assets. Uh, and certainly, other communities should understand and look at our community assets as important as well. And then you get to the very top, and that is your roof. Uh, and, in your, and in your roof is what we typically consider with regards to asset building. That's what can we do to help the individual be more secure in terms of income, in terms of wealth? Well, I would argue that you can't do that without looking at everything else. Uh, but when you get to the roof, you've got everything from your education to your real estate to your business ownership to your savings and checkings account, your retirements, your stocks, your bonds, certainly everything that's going to make you comfortable and your family comfortable over a lifetime. And so with that, by looking at it holistically, we can understand that you know, it's not just about individuals. It is about systems. And we have to understand that systems, and you look at the circle around that, are influenced by your beliefs, your behavior, and certainly the media, certainly education, but also by politics. And so, I think that I've already touched on this, about the, the foundation, uh, the insulation, the fundamentals are in place. No part is sufficient in and of itself. Um, and so the design of that house is largely determined by the political process. 
who we vote for in terms of elected officials, which elected officials run for office, what elected officials consider as policies and introduce as legislation, who writes, who calls, who visits these offices to share their political views, uh, which policies, and that determines, of course, which policies are adopted into law. And I would argue that if interest groups and individuals are not aggressively involved in the political process, the House will not be designed to, ben I guarantee you, the House will not be designed to benefit you. And I think that we've seen that historically. Um, and so you are, this is basic political science 101. You got your executive, legislative, judicial branch. And by the way, uh, the forces that I was talking about earlier in terms of trying to undermine asset building policies, particularly for uh, vulnerable populations, are operating actually on all three fronts. We typically think, tend to think of Congress uh, as the, uh, the, and, the, and the administration as the area, but you know, just look at what's happening with regards to the tr people trying to repeal uh, the health care law that passed. Uh, so we cannot ignore uh, the judiciary. Um, actors in the policy process, the political process, include individuals, organizations, governments. At the individual level, you got your voters, you got your citizens, you got your experts, you got your non-citizens, uh, actors in the policy process. And at the organizational level, corporations, unions, associations, nonprofits, universities, media, you name it. Uh, and at the governmental level, you know, local, state, federal, international, tribal, uh, you certainly you've got various levels of government that are very important to the policy process as well. What do you do at each stage of the policy process? Now, this is actually a riff on a, um, uh, the stages of the policy process in the, in the literature, um, and it's, uh, it's made simple. Uh, so you've got your stage of identifying the problem. And when you're first identifying the problem, you want to really have your research right. You want to know what's going on uh, in the world, uh, you wanted to be able to describe the problem in a real way, and your research and your policy analysis actually backs that up. Uh, you're sharing your qualitative experiences and you have any kind of quantitative data uh, to actually back that up and to say that there actually is a problem. Then you move from identifying the problem to actually raising the problem's profile, right? And that's disseminating the, the, the research results. That's developing policy strategies and products. That's targeting your media uh, to make sure that you're disseminating that information widely. Uh, that's making sure that the public is educated about the, 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 uh, about the issue and the problem. Uh, that's making that policymakers are educated because you got a lot of times, we still have policymakers that are talking about poverty without talking about asset building and wealth creation. Uh, and so that's making sure that policymakers are also educated about not only the problem but the nature of the solution. That's expanding collaborative efforts, making sure that you're organized. Uh, the next stage, developing a solution and getting it adopted. Um, it includes implementing policy and program strategies, developing policymaker champions, building advocacy coalition pressure, uh, identifying the opposition and neutralizing the opposition. Um, and then the next stage is implementing the policy, uh, getting technical assistance or giving technical assistance on policy design. Uh, making sure that your policymaker champions are recognized because they actually need cover. Uh, because sometimes these issues are not easy to carry and uh, they need cover, political cover. Uh, making sure that policymakers with oversight responsibilities are cultivated and that policies and their outcomes are monitored uh, and that strategic action is taken as necessary. So, you know, commenting, you know, uh, making sure that the advocacy continues beyond policy passage. And then once that policy is implemented, it means assessing the impact, making sure that you've got your uh, research and policy analysis going on in terms of looking at that policy and analyzing its effectiveness. And if it's not effective, making sure that people are educated, or if it is effective, making sure that they're educated about why this policy is excellent or why it needs to be amended. Uh, making sure that policymakers are informed of the need for policy changes uh, or for the need for policy elimination. And once you've, you've got that assessment of the impact, you determine if it's, you know, you go for your policy termination or your policy alteration, or a third option is keeping the policy as is. Um, so with this, uh, and if you go to the termination side, you might be redefining the problem, or you might decide that policy is no longer wanted or necessary. If you're altering the policy, it's about going back and making changes to the existing policy, most likely through a reauthorization of a bill or some other type of input. So with that, step
steps to policy change include assessing the policy environment, identifying targets for policy change, creating and implement, implementing an action plan, engaging policymakers, and this is what we typically think when we think of advocacy, just the engagement of policymakers. Uh, engaging the media, maybe. Uh, monitoring outcomes and evaluating results. With regards to assessing the policy environment, what policy changes are needed? Uh, what are policy decisions made? Who controls these decisions? At what level and branch of government? What channels exist for people to participate in the decision-making process? Are the relevant issues widely discussed? Is this a topic of interest for the general public? Is the issue a priority on the public agenda? Do policymakers lack information for making good policy decisions? What related policies were approved and rejected in recent years? This is the assessment of the policy environment. These are the types of questions that you want to ask. Um, with regards to creating and implementing an action plan, uh, are we identifying our target audience in the institution? Can the policy be changed through non-governmental means? Uh, have we developed our short, intermediate, and long-term policy goals and objectives? What stages of the policy process are we actually seeking to influence? Which tactics or strategies are appropriate for that stage? So for example, I mentioned earlier the stages of the policy process, being clear about what part of that process we're in right now. And by the way, with regards to asset building, where do you think we are? Where do we think we are in terms of the asset building uh, policies and closing the racial wealth gap? Wait, raising, the policy, uh, the, raising the problems profile. So we've identified the problem, now we're in the process of raising the profile. And certainly we've got some solutions that are out there, but we continue to develop solutions, right? Um, recruiting, defining benchmarks for success, recruiting strategic allies and identifying opponents, and developing a policy message that resonates and supporting materials that support that message. Um, and sometimes that's meaning, uh, that means that uh, you've got your arguments down, uh, that you're working on building your champions, uh, you're working on neutralizing your opponents, but most importantly, you're acting. And, and when you're engaging policymakers, uh, you want to basically plan activities that will convey your message in the best way, uh, coordinate your activities with the appropriate stages of the policy process. You want to pay attention to level of branch of government. You want to make sure that if you're advocating for something that belongs at the state level, that you're not showing up at the federal level uh, with something where the members don't have any jurisdiction. Um, you want to make sure that your messenger resonates with the policymaker, right? Uh, that you, sometimes it's not good to have Sarah Palin going in to talk to Nancy Pelosi for something. Um, sometimes, you know, it makes sense to make sure that whoever you have carrying your message actually resonates with whoever you're targeting, okay? Um, strategic activities might include your meetings, your calls, emails, briefings, hearings, sharing information, rallies, et cetera. Anything that you want to offer up? Things that, yes. I think about the um, uh, campaign uh, to reduce smoking. And the impact. Uh, I'm sorry. The uh, the emphasis on the connection between smoking and health, and mm -hmm. and the over time the reduction in, in, in the number of places you can smoke, mm -hmm. um, and and therefore consequent decline in the, in the number of smokers. That's right. And in fact, I mean, and that clearly followed the stages of the policy process. You know, so we know that the stages of the policy process work, and if we apply it to asset building and closing the racial wealth gap, it can actually work for us too. So when people think about advocacy, we typically think about the office visit. You know, how to actually go to your policymaker, whether that be your mayor, your city council member, your state legislator, your, your, your congressperson, your senator, uh, to make your case. And so I thought it'd just be important for me to kind of conclude with, you know, some basic recommendations for making the office visit. Now, Charles mentioned that I used to work on the Hill. I did. <laughs> And, and I certainly saw my share of advocates over the, the span of time that I worked on the Hill. Uh, and, and there are things that are important to do when you make these office visits. And so um, the five key elements of effective communication include identifying the issue. You know, you get people who come and talk around the issue but never clearly identify the issue. Uh, personal stories are important. Having a story bank, being able to describe the impact is incredibly important. Most of the people that you go to visit in, in, at any level of government uh, are people just out of college. <laughs> you think that you might have uh, members of Congress, for example, with wise sages sitting in their office. You still do have some. 
but most are like recent graduates just out of undergrad or just out of law school and, and certainly they're captured by personal stories uh, and they need to understand impact. Uh, use key facts to support your case. Make a specific ask. Don't just go and say this is the problem. Say not only this is the problem, but this is what we need for you to do. This is what the policymaker needs to do. This is what the policy is, and this is what needs to be passed. And say thank you and re request a follow-up, making sure that you're remaining connected to your, your, uh, your person. Um, mate, uh, make sure that your group has your action plan already planned out before. Don't be offended if you meet with an aide and not with a, uh, uh, the principal. Uh, be on time, dress appropriately. You sure don't know that. Don't need to know that, right? Um, with regards to a successful meeting, um, uh, be focused on, be courteous, be focused on your discussion. And now I actually have seen, I've seen advocates come and storm in the, uh, into an office and actually take it over. <laughs> <laughs> but that was more like the slash and burn type of tactics uh, of a certain type of organization that you know felt like if they were actually if anarchic uh, in their approach, they would get more attention. I think that they found out over time that their legitimacy was undermined by those types of tactics. Um, uh, and so, you know, these are just some basic hints for a successful meeting. With that, um, I would love to engage you in, a, in any part of this, talking about the depth of policy, talking about actually becoming more effective advocates, talking about, love to engage you in a conversation uh, on any part of this issue. Mm -hmm. Hi. Well, thank you, Maya. That was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> But I, I just wanted to kind of give a little short case study on IDAs as an example because it, it followed the pattern that you talked about almost exactly. But, um, and I'm going to start in states because IDA policy started in states, not at the federal level. But you know, most IDA policy was passed between 96 and 2006 at the state level. And Gina Gunn McClendon and I traveled to about 20 of those states at, to act as expert witnesses, to testify, to give them um, advice on, you know, building the points you were talking about. And, and policies were passed in like 33 states, either, either through the legislature or administrative rule. But about halfway through that process, what we realized was that not all of the populations in the state were being brought to the table at the policy development stage. Mm -hmm. And that's when CSD partnered with First Nations one of the particular groups that was being left out were tribes because tribal governments were not included in the list of folks that could get funding, state or federal, after AFI was passed, directly for IDAs. And not all tribes had nonprofits, or, or, and they were kind of thought of as nonprofits, but it, actually a tribe is not a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So um, we did, we wrote a paper, we had a campaign, we went back to folks, and after the, after the word got out, the next four states that passed legislation actually did include tribal entities. So it is actually possible to, to actually get that racial wealth gap piece in there. You have to do it. You have to make a case and stick to it and inform folks. But legislators in states were very reasonable. They didn't want to, especially states that had a large native population, they didn't want to be the one to exclude that group right. from this particular policy. Right. Uh, because a lot of their constituents were Native Americans. Yeah. So it, it really is possible to make the case mm -hmm. and make it work. But you bring up an interesting point, and not only the tribal point, which is absolutely key, um, but uh, the fact that you all come at this from a particular, you're experts. And so that providing that expert testimony can be a very uh, incredible, important key to that policy process. Uh, and it helps to build the knowledge of policymakers, and it builds credibility for the issues. So you're the ones who are actually developing the research and the information and the facts. Uh, and so, you know, putting yourself out there uh, to be actually those expert witnesses or testifying uh, is absolutely key. Um, and actually, uh, that is part of the effort underway with the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative. Uh, to try to advance policy experts on Capitol Hill. Now, having worked on Capitol Hill, I can tell you that um, most of, most who, most, the fact of who gets to testify before Congress and who doesn't is almost always a function of staff. Uh, and, and if you don't have diverse staff uh, who understand and are familiar with diverse experts, 
uh, then you get uh, outcomes that I argue are suboptimal. Uh, and so I think it's fundamentally a part of the de de democratic process uh, to make sure that we actually have uh, very different voices at the table, as you mentioned, helping to shape policies at the creation stage, the formulation stage, uh, because uh, if you don't have that, then you have people who have an imagination or an idea about what your problem is, but they, haven't, they don't have the experiential kind of context in order to define the solution in a way that actually is impactful, truly, uh, to the populations that are affected. The race, racial wealth gap is huge, and a lot of the programs that we're talking about are, are relatively small and may not be sufficient to really uh, uh, you know, solve the racial wealth gap. But I'm wondering, uh, at least in the short term, I'm wondering to what extent does uh, sort of mass mobilization around some of these issues help in the policy process? Uh, you see all kinds of, here in Washington, of course, every day there's another huge demonstration of one kind or another, whether it's the pro-lifers or the May Day immigration demonstrations or so on, all of which are aimed at affecting you know, policy either at the Supreme Court level or at the con congressional level. Uh, to, to what extent in this particular issue area do you think any of that kind of activity would be helpful or can it be combined with the more intricate work of uh, interviewing the legislators and so on? What, what is the role of that sort of activity in this particular er r policy area? That's a good question and it depends on, on the strategy and, and the level of, I think, uh, impact you're seeking to achieve. Do you need a mass grassroots movement in order to get policies adopted and implemented? Absolutely not. Uh, is it helpful to have ground troops across the country who can be called at a moment's notice and mobilized to go to state houses? And <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so it depends on the scale and the scope of the strategy uh, and what the particular policy outcomes you're looking for are. Uh, for this particular, for, for asset building policy, I would argue that if we're going for the whole house, we need ground troops. And since I'm arguing that the whole house needs to be constructed in a way that supports closing the racial wealth gap, I think that it is important to do mass education and organization and thinking about how to look at this systematically and, and advocate systematically nationwide. Uh, because we're, talking, we're not talking about one discrete policy. We're talking about a whole series of policies, and you have to understand them as a portfolio and not as, as siloed issues. Sometimes we make a decision that the legislator is not there and the aide walks in, we make a decision to walk out. How does that fare with the legislators? I mean, so, what, how do they gauge that? So first of all, at the state and local level, I would absolutely be demanding to meet with the policymaker. Right. <laughs> The principal is who you absolutely want to meet with, unless it's an issue expert right. on the staff. Everybody knows that that's his go-to person. You know, you know that that person has the policymaker's ear. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, you, if an intern shows up and you're expecting the policymaker, absolutely walk out of the room. Uh, however, you know, um, I think at, at the federal level, it's a different ball of wax. Um, because at the federal level, you cannot imagine the, uh, the, the, the number and the level of, of competing interests that show up at a congressional office in the daytime. The, 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 the sheer number of letters that they're receiving, not only now hard mail, but also email, uh, the sheer number of letters of inquiry requesting meetings cannot be handled by one person alone. And actually, I think that this actually needs to be, um, in, this, is, this is an issue because I actually think that this is an issue for democracy or the republic, as you, you might say, if you're getting technical about it. Um, but, um, you know, that I would argue that, um, that policymakers at the federal level are beyond their capacity in the, in the legislative branch, mm -hmm. and that they do not yet have the systems to be able to um, fully integrate and deal with the, uh, the, the, le the level and nature of the requests. And so that's why you've got, uh, that's why you've got organizations and corporations actually doing the work for them. Uh, and it compromises in some respects, it can compromise the, the policy process. So we do a lot of the letter writing campaigns, the phone calls, we do a lot of the footwork. So how does, how does that help the issues? Because I mean, we make hundreds of thousands of phone calls. I mean, we call in the troops. Does it really have an impact? I know we seem to think that it does, but coming from the heel, what do they see? 
Good question. Okay. And um, I think impact depends on a number of things, not just the, 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 the intellectual capital you're generating through letters or cards or whatever, but also timing. Mm -hmm. You know, where are we on the policy process? Uh, you know, is, is there a, a immediate vehicle through which your, your issue can be addressed? So, I mean, that goes back to your strategy for planning. <clears throat> you escalate to those kinds of tactics when the timing is right. right. <coughs> and you don't just, you don't just use them willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you use them willy-nilly, then you're, sometimes you're, pardon the term, pissing in the wind. But um, if, you, um, if you are strategic, I think that they can be very impactful. Um, I, have seen, I have seen actions where they have mobilized mass calls that have shut down the, key, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the phone bank uh, on the, at the Capitol. And policymakers who are, they're like, okay, why are my phones not working? And they find out it's about an issue and the issue gets addressed because they want their phones to work. <laughs> I have, seen, uh, I have seen mass uh, letter writing campaigns where staff are overwhelmed and what they do is they just, they just look at the card and say, is it pro or con? And what they do is they'll stack the cards for the pros and they'll stack the cards for the cons and at the end of the day, if the pros are larger than the cons, that's the way the member is going to go. Oh, wow. I have okay. seen, I mean literally, literally, uh, if it's calls where the keyboard or the, not the keyboard, the phone board, what's it called? The Switchboard, yeah, <laughs> where the switchboard hasn't been shut down. You've got your, your, your staffers who are answering the phones, you know, just trying to determine if it's pro or con. Uh, and then they'll, they'll take the tally, pro, con. Um, so, you know, you've got, it's about timing, it's about your, your action strategy, it's about, you know, but certainly it can be impactful. It can be. Uh, but you do have to make sure it's timed right.